to impress you, but we want to share. Please on, Laura. So for effective presentation, uh, mainly there are three contributory factors over here with respect, respect to this workshop. Huh? Effective presentation, you see, when you prepare your PowerPoint in particular, all of this PowerPoint, okay, during our lecture, and there's always a tendency to so easily drag this uh, picture here, to easily copy and paste text inside. After all, after all, I got response from many lecturers, my students, my notes is actually my PowerPoint. And since they're going to prepare for the exam, reading the PowerPoint, I put and copy and paste uh, all the text inside my PowerPoint. You know what I mean? It could be your practice, okay? Which is normal, that's what students want. They want the notes in the PowerPoint. So there's a tendency to you know, throw in your text there, okay? So uh, we, we will consider all these factors. Huh? Now, when you put too many things inside, what happened is something called cognitive load. So I will just mention a little bit about these terms for you first so that you can follow. Huh? Uh, cognitive load, whatever that we do in the university, whatever discipline we are from, uh, is actually imparting something for the students to process at the cognitive level. So it's actually information coming in to be processed and hopefully that information is processed and go into long-term memory to be considered as real learning taking place. Okay? The problem is if there are too many things, there's something called overload. It's called cognitive overload. And when there's cognitive overload, then the information processing will not be at its optimum condition. So my objective today is to show you how we can have an optimum condition in here for our student in particular so that whatever that you impart to them it can be processed optimally so that's my challenge to share to you that engagement and active learning so whatever that we want we don't want a student to be just passively receiving receiving you know but uh, bring them into participation in active learning meaningful learning okay and for this to take place uh, Dr. Kenneth will show you something called H5P, and I won't go into detail about that. And that wonderful tool will be able to make your presentation face-to-face, -face, your presentation in blended learning online, more engaging and bringing in active learning. So this is our two main objectives, okay? How to reduce cognitive load in our presentation and tools for you to bring in this kind of uh, student-centered, engaging, active learning. On. Okay, now, uh, I bring you some theories, okay? So my job today in the morning is to show you the theoretical aspect. After all, we are all academic. You want to know why in the world should I be listening to this? And I'm bringing you uh, things that is research-based, okay? Uh, evidences. Now, this is uh, Richard Mayer. Okay, and Professor Richard Mayer has got a theory called cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Uh, these days, with PowerPoint, these days with YouTube, these days with uh, blended learning, our smart UMS, multimedia is there. They are actually being, uh, there's all kinds of components are being thrown to them. So, how does it bring in learning? How does multimedia contribute to learning? So. How many have seen this diagram before? Put up the hand. No, huh? Okay, so all at the same uh, level. So try to follow me. Uh, I got to point over here so that the other side knows that I'm pointing, whatever. Okay, so on the left hand side, I'm going to go forward. I'm going to go from here to here, okay? So on the left hand side shows the multimeter display that is uh, either the book or either your PowerPoint or your YouTube, your video. Okay, this is the one, multimedia display, all right? And it can come in the form of pictures, in come of graphic, animation, video. It can come in the form of uh, printed words, okay? And here is the sensory memory, and that is where I'm speaking. You are listening to my narration, and it's entering through the ear, all right? And then you are looking at this uh, diagram, 
and this picture is going into your eyes so it goes through the sensory memory and certain things are selected to go into your working memory selection is going on now the tricky part is this sometimes too many things are on the screen so you are talking talking but the students are not able to select the right thing okay so we need to have a way to actually uh, get them to stay focused upon the thing that they're talking about example now this pointer you see at least you know that i'm talking about this so you, you could be looking at this floor you know see wondering how old is he <laughs> okay and if is able to get into our working memory then it will be organized as a verbal model the images or your videos will go become a pictorial model and they could be integrated with prior knowledge to become real meaningful learning okay so you have an idea that uh, according to Mayer, okay the theory to support multimedia learning can be seen in this particular diagram okay and what i'm going to show to you will be based upon this diagram okay the reason why we're using multimedia to support learning and how we could make better presentation in our instructional design okay using this particular model this theory okay those who just came in i must go through this very quickly okay give me one minute everybody bear with me now those who just came in this is the cognitive theory of multimedia learning and what i'm going to share for one hour will be based upon this diagram okay so over here is our powerpoint it could be your video okay this is our sensory organs the ear the eyes okay and this is our working memory and this one is our long-term memory working memory whatever that is there will last for just for a short time okay and it will you can just forget it very fast the one that can remain okay forever in us will be the in the long-term memory okay so our challenge is to produce something where whatever is presented it finally will be able to go into the long-term memory of our student okay move on okay so this is the basis of our one hour huh? so please follow it's just the starting huh? now in this particular cognitive theory of multimedia learning uh, Richard Mayer said there are three assumptions there are three assumptions number one dual channel there are two separate channel for processing information over here there are two one for through the ear that means the auditory channel and another one here the visual channel okay auditory and visual so there are two channels you you may say no there are more than that especially in the food industry you will say hey what about the nose what about the touch yes but i'm at the moment talking at the cognitive level okay whatever that goes in and uh, according to this theory you can bring in touch you can bring in uh, other aspect and form your own model eventually and i mean it please go on assumption number two limited capacity this channel has limited capacity if it is more it will gonna tersumbat <laughs> it is overloaded not everything go in certain things can go in okay so you're talking about a thousand and one thing but actually only five things went in so sorry uh, at the end of the day when you ask your student actually they do get an idea of the rest of the whatever we're talking about okay they couldn't miss it they could have missed it okay having said that uh we must notice that our students are also their their, di their different capacity okay we also note that okay so limited capacity so be careful of whatever that we are presenting okay keep it be a minimalist keep it short keep it simple okay okay something that actually you are, you are uh, practicing you are already practicing maybe it is now just being uh, formalized through this person that's all okay? <laughs> with the certain terms go on please and learning is an active processing taking place here selecting organizing and integration of information with prior knowledge what is multimedia learning it means that it is an active process 
where selection is going on, whatever you present is being selected by the student, you know, consciously or unconsciously. Okay? Matter of how you actually scaffold it. And then they get it organized and then they integrate it with prior knowledge and then becomes long term memory. Okay, so these are three assumptions. Move on. Oh, okay, on, yeah, on. So selecting, organizing, integrating. So, yeah. And this will bring in uh, meaningful multimedia learning within a learner. Okay, move on. So in summary, people learn better from multimedia messages that are designed in ways that are consistent with how the human mind works with research-based principle. So uh, Mayer and his uh, many students, including myself, okay, uh, at least when I was in USM, okay, my students uh, based their PhD research work a lot on this particular theory. Cognitive theory for multimedia learning. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you don't mind, please uh, accept this theory for now. Okay, that that is the way the mind, the brain works for cognitive processing in multimedia learning. You may have other theories, you know, but for now, please uh, bear with me in this. Okay, <laughs> okay, move on. So a few more terms you need to get yourself familiar with. Okay. So that when we discuss, it will be easier for you. Now, for cognitive processing during learning, in our student, okay, the cognitive processing, there are three types called extraneous, essential, and generative cognitive processing in the brain. Okay? And if it is extraneous, the word extra implies, you know, the lampau, the lalu banya, the extra. Okay? It's not benefiting the student. The extra music, the extra jumping Mickey Mouse is annoying. It's causing a burden. Huh? It's a causing a cognitive overload. So it's not related, moreover, to instructional goal. So if there is a reason that it should be there, it must be related to the objective, of course, of your lesson. If it is not for the fun of it or making it more so-called uh, fun, uh, it might be actually not related to the instructional goal. Hence. It is a poor instructional design, okay? And this is called extraneous. And this extraneous bring in extraneous cognitive overload. Now, that is what we want to reduce, okay? So we want to reduce this extraneous processing, which is causing an overload in our student, in our student. Hmm? Essential cognitive processing, okay? So aim at representing essential material. So, for example, you're teaching on uh, cell division and meiosis, for example, pembahagian cell. It's a very complicated uh, kind of thing going on, okay? Now, complexity of the material, how do you present it in such a way that it becomes simplified for our student? Now, that is our challenge. So, this is how do you manage complex, complex uh, material and that will be under essential cognitive processing. So example, which is a video that is lasting for five minutes, you may want it to be broken into five phases. So five short phases, now that is called managing it. You are segmenting it, okay, for whatever reason. Generative, uh, aim at making sense of essential material. So this essential material, how could we, especially in blended learning, you put the materials in our smart UMS, are our students assessing it? Are our students just clicking it and then going away? Or are our students motivated, inspired somehow to go on with what you are presenting and interacting with your materials? Are they doing that? Now, that is the generative cognitive processing. How could you motivate a student to move on without your presence there? It's a challenge. It's not easy. So this is where uh, Dr. Kenneth, okay, now he will be showing how you can make use of certain tools that are available, that are user friendly, Mosra Pangguna, okay, and for you and for your student. When I say for you and for your student, uh, the way that I always, whenever I pick up a new tool, I do not just use a tool for myself, I very quickly share it with my student. And I say, 
in your project, I expect you to use it. Then you will say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not technology savvy. How could I be telling them what tool to use? Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the digital era. Many of us are migrants. We came into their world. Second, you're a migrant. You migrate. You came into their world. So you just have to tell them, uh, please make use of the current technology of today uh, to enhance your project. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. You don't have to teach them. They know. They know how to go about picking up a tool just within one evening or even a few minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are for learning taking place, okay? We must remember that there are extraneous cognitive processing and that extra, extra, we want to reduce that extra news cognitive processing. It's causing that cognitive overload. Essential generative, this is what we want. We want to increase it. Increase generative so that our student in student-centered learning environment will be motivated to continue without our presence. Okay? And how especially you make very complicated uh, learning materials to be simplified and even to be self access you know they, they self directed they, they just want to go on by themselves be motivated move on okay so i'm going to show you now some principles okay try to follow it uh, all these notes are given to you okay we have a website where all these are given to you so you can stop me at any time okay to ask and to not agree no problem, okay? Uh, multimeter principle, people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. Uh, the rationale is, we should take advantage of the full capacity of human mind for processing information. So what is the human mind again? You follow the Mayer's theory, cognitive for multimeter learning. Huh? That there are two channels going in, through the eyes and through the ear. So we want to maximize information going into our mind to these two channels, two organs. Move on. Reading this text, okay? So now the question is, are you able to visualize what is going on here? Many students got the capacity for doing that, but many are not able to. They need visuals to support the description. So we have to cater for, you know, the whole scope of our students. So what is this? The house leader in Mauritius development, blah, 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 blah. If you go on with a diagram, yeah, then actually it is describing this. So whatever field that we are in, okay, a diagram, a picture speaks a thousand words or a million words. And this is the first basic principle of multimedia learning, okay? Uh, other than text, yeah, text is still very important. Sangat sangat diperlukan, okay? But uh, we must know that pictures, graphics, can support it, can clarify it. Okay. Mm. By the way, this picture again, I like to say, because one of my favorite pictures, I took it myself uh, with my own uh, handphone when I was in Mauritius. In the room, it's a house lizard. It's a house lizard. <laughs> okay, that's how beautiful the place is. Go and visit Mauritius. Okay, move on. It's next to Africa. Okay, so now, this is the tricky part. How are we going to reduce extraneous processing? Okay, so let's go for it. Huh? Coherence principle, signaling principle, redundancy principle, spatial continuity, temporal continuity. I tell you, all, all these are just terms. But it's coined up by Richard Mayer, you see. So you could have been practicing it, but just that we didn't use the term. All right? So, what in the world is coherence principle? Let's have a look. Move on. Okay. And these are all essential. Huh? People learn better when extra news, extra pictures, extra sounds are excluded. Okay, as simple as that. People are better able to focus on the essential material. If we eliminate the extra material, that could actually distract them. Okay. So, in principle, we keep it short and keep it simple. And something that we are practicing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So this is actually something called the coherence principle. It's just a term, all right? Okay. So uh, just now, uh, we may come back to it. But in all in all, 
uh, coherence principle, if you are talking about a particular object, okay, let's say you're talking about a shape, a triangle, and you're describing what a triangle is, and if you have other things flying around, and you have some kind of a music background, if you have different kind of uh, electrifying effect here and there, these are extraneous. You know what I mean? So, what is the object in focus you're talking about? That should be the highlight. Other things will just come and uh, distract and become a cognitive overload. So, do bear in mind. Huh? When we pre especially for PowerPoint. Huh? Keep it short and simple. Now, how do we... What is this spatial contiguity principle? Uh, contiguity, it means... Huh, uh, dipaparkan secara serentak. It means uh, simultaneously you present them. Contiguity. Uh, it means uh, kalau you have a text, you have a graphic, let them be presented simultaneously at the same time. Okay. Uh, uh, spatial depending means uh, the the space in between. Okay. Okay. The space in between them. So according to Richard Mayer, okay, click. He says people learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented near rather than far from each other on the screen. Now, relatively, of course, the screen is quite small, but uh, what do you mean by far and near? Move on. <laughs> relatively, this is far. Okay, we need the screen. Hmm? Relatively, wait, what is A? I need to turn my head. I need to look, oh, A is frontal, look, I turn back, I look, hey, what is F? Oh, F. Or oh, Peter look, that is far. <laughs> Move on. Move on. Oh, or oh, Peter look, oh, frontal look, okay, temporal look. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> it makes a difference. It reduces cognitive processing. It reduces cognitive look. So... It, you may not know this, but actually it is a, it's a burden on the student when they look at something that they're going to refer to here and there, even though the screen is small. All right? Uh, all this, a lot of research has been done, okay, to prove the validity and the reliability of this. Move on, please. So, question now. Ladies and gentlemen, put up your hand. Huh? Increasing or reducing extraneous cognitive load in learners if we have this water cycle and this thing is going on, look. The description about this, about this condensation, water vapor changes into liquid cloud, precipitation. High cognitive load or low cognitive load? Okay, relative, another one. If we have pressure condensation, precipitation, now what's going on over here? Condensation, oh, oh, rah, 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 rah. okay. Now, relatively, uh, this is high or low? High cognitive load or low cognitive load, comparatively? High? 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 high. high? Put up the hand, high, 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 high. Yeah, low, low, low. Anyone say this low? High, okay. So, back again. Okay, there you are. So, you see, having the text as close as possible to the graphical part you're talking about. Now, that reduces cognitive processing. That reduces extraneous cognitive processing. Okay, move on. Move on. So, again, this is special contiguity principle. And once again, people may focus on the printed words rather than the relevant portion of the graphic. And there are evidences. Okay, there are evidences. Uh, those of you where your students might want to go and uh, do some research in this area, or you yourself, okay? A lot of literature, okay? Another one, how to reduce that cognitive overload, the extraneous cognitive overload. Another one is called signaling principle. People will learn more eff efficiently if the lesson is designed to call their attention to the important material in the lesson and how it is organized, okay? So signaling is very easy. Uh, when I am, when face to face, for example, and then we want to emphasize a particular point, we just change the volume of our voice, probably. Or maybe change the tone of our speaking. Now, that is easy for all of us. 
okay, when face to face, or body language, you know, body language. You no, know, then you know, you know there's something important coming up already, okay. So blah 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 blah. You see, so signaling, signaling, huh? bringing them to pay attention to a particular point. Okay. And also, of course, now, this is a signal. Huh? Now, example. Huh? Or, uh, later on, Dr. Kenneth will show you, and Nora will show, okay, uh, how you can use certain cursor actually to circle certain things. Redundancy principle, another one. Move on. Okay, move on. On. Okay. People learn better from graphic and narration than from graphic narration and on screen text. If you have uh, on-screen text, and then you have also narration, narrating the on-screen text with graphic, compared to just the animation with the narration, which one do you think will bring in better information processing? Okay. Move on. Mm -hmm. The question here is, what if our students say, I learn better with rock music as a background? You, you, you cannot say it's nonsense. It's real to him. To him it's real, isn't it? To him, to us, to you, it's a problem, no? If the assessment of the student always good, then maybe it's real. Yeah, yeah. So, it calls for research, and it's true. There are people uh, who need music as a background to bring them into optimal condition for learning. I mean, our experience tells us so. Huh? Uh, some want slow music, some want rock music, for whatever reason. I cannot say that it's wrong. Huh? We have to say yes, and yeah, there's something happening. There's so much more to be actually researched upon, huh? this human brain of ours. I don't know how it really works. <laughs> okay. People may fall, okay, redundancy principle. Uh, we'll be talking about this system. Okay, so some of the uh, work that is done, for example, now Moreno and Mayer are the two major ones, okay? And here you can also see myself uh, also doing some work here with my student, Sandra. And another, got another student by the name of Adalala, Osama. So Osama happens to be my student, by the way. And he really wanted to go to America. He couldn't get entry. It's true. He said, my name, somehow. <laughs> somehow, my name. Okay, move on. Temporal continuity principle. People learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented simultaneously rather than successively. So, move, move. Example, if we are talking about, you know, scorpion, the text is there. Okay, continue. Or you're talking about this diagram, scorpion, blah, 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 blah. Or, simultaneously you present them. Okay, so, uh, do in mind, you know, that something you're talking about uh, is before the student that reduces extraneous cognitive processing, okay? Rather than, uh, do you remember the picture I showed you last week? Do you remember the picture I showed you just now? Okay, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, extraneous cognitive processing is taking place. Extra load. <laughs> Something that we are quite used to doing, okay? Do you remember the diagram? Okay, go on, please. Okay. Principles for managing essential uh, processing. Now, this is the part where, again, we want to manage this part. It's so complicated, the way to cook the food. It's so complicated to build the machine. It's so complicated to treat the patient in this way and that way. So, this is the way to actually manage essential processing. There are three of them. Go. Okay. Example. Ah, uh, a video. 
increasing uh, essential processing, increasing cognitive load. So there's a tendency that we even use video, there's a tendency, okay, that there'll be an offense upon cognitive load. Move on. Okay. So example this one, uh, I, I like to actually say, you know, that uh, this video, there is a problem with this video. Okay. So you have been accused of increasing essential overload. Huh? And what is essential overload? Fast-paced process contain components that are complicated for the learner. So is this uh, violating something called the segmented principle? Okay, this is a long process, okay, having uh, 10 phases there at least. Now these 10 phases, they are complicated. Huh? Uh, not many people can follow easily on how one cell could produce four cells yang langsung tasa iras. Langsung different. Huh? Okay. So the way is to segment it. Go on. So again, Richard Mayer say, people learn better from multimedia lesson that is presented in learner pace segment. Means you break them into different phases. At the end of each short clip, you can put a continue button or repeat button. Now that helps the student. That helps. Okay, so segmenting. Huh? Remember that. Uh, even when you produce your MOOC under Dr. Kenneth, uh, you will see that he tell you, I want only clips huh, that is 5 minutes or 10 minutes the most, uh, things like that. We want it to be segmented if possible. Hmm? Go on. Okay. So again, segmenting allow learners to engage essential processing without overloading the learner's cognitive system. So we are, our problem is cognitive load, you know, in our student. They are A student, all of them are good students. But just that our PowerPoint happens to be killing them. Our PowerPoint has been overloading them. Okay, it's called cognitive overload. So do bear in mind, okay, that uh, the next time you produce your PowerPoint, do bear in mind these principles, okay, to try to minimize uh, your, keep it short and keep it simple. Okay, in principle, move on. Okay, segmenting uh, principles. So there you are. These are my students. And in fact, my PhD alone was actually, I did on something called effects of animation on the learning of meiosis. I happen to be actually a science man. Uh, my history is actually I'm a science teacher. I'm a biology teacher. Okay, I was a teacher for close to 20 years in the school before I joined USM. Huh? <laughs> I came in as a kaedah mengajar biology punya lecturer, huh? pedagogy aspect of teaching biology. Then later on, I did my master and my PhD. I do this, I can enter with a master, you see? Then I did my PhD at that time in the field of multimedia. Okay, so I stand upon this theory, actually. That's why I'm prom still promoting it. Okay, continue. Pre-training principle, People learn better from a multimedia lesson when they know the names and characteristics of the main concept. So, this time we are talking about what is this extraneous uh, cognitive <laughs> processing, you know, that thing called uh, generative processing. Okay, Th those are new terms. And I was trying to get you familiar with the terms. So, when we are talking about it, at least you, you can relate. You can relate. So, pre training. Before you start your lecture, you probably might want to introduce them to some definition first. Uh, or maybe to a mind map first. Uh, something to get them familiarized before they go into something uh, new. Go on. Okay. And all these, a lot of research are done in these areas. A lot. Okay. Yeah, go on. And this one is called modality principle. People learn better from animation with narration than from animation with on-screen text. So, if you are using something where the eye, something is entering the eye, and a portion of it is being narrated, then this is good. As compared to, if you are looking at a video, and you're also reading the caption below, you know what I mean? <laughs> or going to only the eye. Cognitive overload, okay? In the visual channel. We have to consider that. So, this is to maximize actually the entry of information into the working memory. That is the idea, okay? Uh, 
again, some of you will not agree to this. Huh? Some may not agree. And there are exceptions to the rule. There are. There are. Huh? There are. Uh, especially those, you know, who are weak in English and they're talking in English, okay? So they may not be able to hear properly. They may need that, type, that text down there. They may need it. But me is saying, even if you use it, then use suck sing text. Suck sing, yeah, ringkas, uh, ringkas. Don't put the whole sentences, you know, exactly what you're saying there. Okay? But just short, short text to support it. There are exceptions to the rule. Definitely there are in all of them. Move on. Okay? And, uh, okay? Now, again, uh, I was doing it with Osama the last time in 2012. Yeah. I came here in 2015. Okay, move on. And the last part, the last part, okay? The last part. After this, you can go for your breakfast, according to Adrian, okay? Then you will come back and Dr. Kelly will take over. Principles for fostering generative processing. Personalization principle, voice principle, and image principle. What are they? Move on. Okay. People learn better from multimedia lessons than words in conversational style rather than formal style. So if you should be narrating something, uh, just in the class, you see, this is not formal. Huh? It is conversational style. Okay. Compared to, uh, like in the formally, you know, okay, uh, you know what I mean? It, it's different. There's an effect. This happens to be my student from China. Okay. And she did on this, just on this personalization principle. Conversation style can provide a sense of social presence to the learner, which causes the learner to be engaged in appropriate cognitive processing. Huh? Somehow. Okay. The social presence in the conversational way. Like talking to you, talking to you, talking to your student. Okay, go on. The voice principle. Click it. <laughs> okay. Human voice is intended to prime a sense of social presence again. Please remember that our students, when they come into the online environment, you are not there. The human is not there. Our dear presence is not there, which cannot be replaced. Okay. But at least, if we could simulate our presence to be there, okay? Social presence. So maybe a human voice rather than a machine voice, okay? Okay. Cannot, huh? Okay, go on. <coughs> Embodiment principle. People learn more deeply when on-screen agents display human-like gestures, movement, eye contact, facial expression. So... Try to remember, humanize that learning environment online. Humanize it, okay, to whatever means. And of course, depend on who is the targeted group, whether young or whether adults, you know, use the appropriate uh, embodiment, use the use appropriate avatar. Huh? Okay. So the human action is intended to create a sense of social presence again. Hmm? Remember, you're interacting with the machine. Okay. But the young people today don't say that, you know. It's my generation that say I'm interacting with a machine, okay? But the young people, hey, that avatar is their dear friend. That avatar is as real as the brother in the house. <laughs> they go on uh, MMORPG, huh? massive uh, you know, online uh, role-playing games. And there they are talking with people from all over the world and to them, that is my real dear friend. Okay? He knows me better than my daddy. You know what I mean? Some of them. I know him better than my mother. Some say that. <laughs> which is dangerous. Which is pretty dangerous. Okay? So there's a need to actually monitor who are they in the world talking to. I mean, having said that, you know, should we stop? Using Facebook because somebody you know, live stream the stupid thing in Australia. Should we stop using Facebook? No? So at least uh, Air Asia uh, CEO stop it, okay, for whatever reason. And he's right in a way, okay. But uh, I, I would say, you know, because uh, we are promoting the use of uh, technology in enhancing teaching and learning, 
Yes, there are many negative things in there. With one click, another click, they go into another world, our student. Okay? Though we want them to be in smart UMS, but they are there and they put it on, but they just minimize it and they are something else, doing something else. Uh, knowing that such things are happening, that is where is our challenge. There lies our challenge, ladies and gentlemen. How could we uh, have generative cognitive processing, keep them motivated, keep them moving? So make sure that our things are you know, following the principle just now. Okay. And that is the challenge given to Dr. Kenneth. How could we use tools, their tools, their tools, okay, uh, to continue to keep them, keep them okay, actively participating? Move on. Okay. Any on-screen uh, agent, those days, static pictures of Mickey Mouse enough, but it's not good enough for the young people of today. <laughs> they need to, if I move my cursor there, the eye at least follow the cursor. The, the avatar must be living. <laughs> you know? so, and there are these things around. They are available. Okay? Uh, I'm tired. I, my eyes is too tired. I'm going to close my eyes. But I want to continue listening to what is going on. So Dr. Kenneth will show you, you know, how you just tell your computer to read the text for you, okay? And many times uh, I did that also when I'm tired, okay? You close your eyes and there you are. It's reading the news for you, reading your whatever for you. And it's so easy. Uh, go on. Image, okay, the last one, image principle, okay? People do not necessarily learn better from a multimeter lesson when the speaker's image is added to the screen. Now, you put a text there, and let's say this is a video, and they're talking blah, 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 blah about this. Uh, maybe one slide will do. Second slide, third slide, you're still there. <laughs> that time, they'll be wondering, how funny you look, Fong. <laughs> and what, what, it's not matching, your time is not matching. And why, why, why this color? They'll be distracted and look at something else. Uh, it might be a distractor. So when you produce your move, uh, Dr. Kendall will probably show you, uh, in the beginning, yes, it's good to show your real presence there. So for a beginning, okay? After that, you swing away into the corner of the slide or get yourself lost from there. <laughs> yeah, and just your voice. Your voice is good enough and the presence. So there you are, this and this going in. We purposely intentionally do that. Then somewhere along the line, you appear again just to do some body gestures huh, to keep them uh, going, okay? And you fade yourself away again. At the end, make sure you come back. <laughs> make sure you come back, okay? And especially if you should be giving them any quiz and so on, there are feedbacks. Huh? So make sure your presence is there, feedback. Whenever I give a forum to my student, the first person to respond I would always uh, put the part, you know, and then uh, screen capture it and uh, put it on the front page to tell the student, you know, that I am responding. I am reading every point that you're putting there, okay? But I can only have time to look at the first, second, third. After that, the other hundreds are there, you know, thinking the phone will uh, come and say something. Uh, here and there, at random, I will pick. Okay. But we cannot, we cannot, okay? So the way to overcome such kind of problem, for example, uh, uh, because the presence must be there. Our presence must be there in the forum. Hmm? So at least in the beginning, you show your presence by giving some comment. Okay? After that, they will think that you're still there forever, 24 hours. <laughs> Bring them into groups, in the discussion, in the forum, okay? and tell them that you know, this particular thing, okay, I am watching you, but do comment upon one another's comment. Be critical. Give constructive comment. Give critique, give constructive comment. Okay? And at one more point, I'm grading all your comments. That's good enough. <laughs> I'm grading all your comments. Okay? Tak mau jom, makan jom, pi minum. Okay? In the beginning, okay, let them play. But after that, you just give a serious note to it. Okay? And they will be able to actually enjoy themselves uh, in a very constructive way. Okay. Or still image principle, there you are. Uh, it can be a talking head, okay? Uh, it can be just your slide with your voice, narrating it. And it could be 
you at the corner there all the way through for whatever reason there are certain uh, fields where the body language is so important it needs to be there uh, especially in pronunciation in learning languages I guess uh, or in dancing uh, those arts you know they, they, they need it uh, Teddy, uh, uh, in the fine arts they, they need uh, the body to be there okay these notes are there for you to show that uh, all these, actually a lot of experiments have been done uh, to show that uh, they are all empirically based, go on. Empirically based, go on. Empirically based, yes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I open to just one or two questions, okay? One or two questions. Were you able to kind of follow? Does it relate to your experience? Does it relate to your experience, Dr. Sekarang? The words are new to me. Right? Yeah, the words are new. There you are. Correct. Uh, but I think by, by hands-on, we are doing it. That's right. By hands-on, by experience, we are practicing it. Huh? Yeah. It just... Yeah. We, we learn from experiment that uh, the class goes off and change and Yes, yes. 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 So, from experience, okay? But uh, it mesh with the empirical evidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The class goes to sleep, that means it's not working. Right? Hmm. It's disengaged, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. You change your slides and you can... Yeah, something is not working, huh? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the blame normally you will question uh, yourself or the system. <laughs> uh, they can't. They can't stand plain text, I, I Okay, there you are. Uh, they cannot stand plain text. So the multimedia principle must come in. Mm -hmm. There you are. Okay. But I also blame that. Uh, why we need to entertain the students? Hmm. A little bit of entertainment. So we come entertainers some <laughs> Is that a plus? It is large because it also makes us a bit lively. Lively. Yeah. Sigrun so is saying that uh, in a way we are also we need to be entertainer, huh? entertainers. And I think that's where the fun of learning comes in. Huh? Things that are so complex, you make it uh, into chunk and make it simplified and make it uh, so able for the student to follow. Wow, that's a great educator. But, but that's a, a sign of a genius, right? Mm. Something hard and simplified. And yes, yes, and yes. Play with it, uh, then you are really yes. <laughs> Good. Sorry, you're asking something. Sorry, I just Yes. I mean, we have to fit our slides, whatever, into the, what they call this, uh, the, because MK always uh, audit us, and each lecture, or so each uh, presentation have to achieve a certain thing. So how can we, I mean, is there any ways or how to go about this? Uh -huh, like uh -huh. our slides and our presentation with the blended learning that it uh, fulfill whatever is in the MQA content. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Each, uh, yeah, so there's one question over here. Uh, does this comply to MQA? Okay. <laughs> does it comply to MQA? Yeah. <laughs> in, in, okay. With respect to MQA, for example, there are certain KPI and so on. Okay, for example, blended learning. Okay, uh, so in general, uh, blended learning, there might be certain percentage of online learning. But within the micro aspect of it, how you implement your online learning, whether effective or not effective, now this is what we are addressing. So you are still along the line of MQA in that sense. We are. Okay, one more question. Dr. Hasno, boleh? Boleh, boleh terima ini. Boleh terima. I think you have a lot of questions. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, the videos uh, later on when you go to the website that Doctor Kenneth show you uh, later on, we will put it there for you. Okay, thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you.